Welcome to the last step. Yeah. So Frank is off in Mallorca finding our new house with David and Lisa. So he won't be joining us today, but I will be having a guest from South Africa, which is Catherine, who if you've watched our online retreats and so forth, you may have heard her speak. And uh, she'll be joining us. I did want to share a few miracles that, uh, that have been happening to me, and most of all this morning. But first I'd like to start with uh, Friday night we went to, or Friday afternoon, we went and saw the movie Aquaman, which, you know, came with rave reviews and we were all excited to see it. And yeah, the metaphors and everything behind it did not let down. There was, there was a few scenes in there that really, that really touched me deeply and I may speak about those uh, in a bit. But we were driving back from the, uh, from the movie and I had mentioned that it was five years, you know, you know, this, this show is about from 12 step recovery to a life of full devotion. And, you know, I don't identify with a group anymore, or a certain 12 step group. And I don't really go to meetings very, very infrequently when I can get a chance. But I had said something in the car that it was five years. And one of the girls in the car was like, oh, I have a coin at the house. And I was like, you have a coin at the house. I haven't gotten a coin, you know, since two years or whatever. So I didn't really think much of it at the time. And then in the morning, so the 21st was the last day I used a substance. And the 22nd would actually be the day that people in 12 steps would consider it your day of sobriety. And I walked into the kitchen and yeah, right by the sink was, was a five year coin. And like, as soon as I saw it, it was just this like, I was overwhelmed, you know, it was, you know, and the mind's like, what are the odds that she had a roommate, you know, and thank you, Tamara, if you're watching. I think this may have been your coin at one point. And it was so beautiful because I just sent an old coin that Nicholas was wearing a pair of my pants and he found a coin in the pocket and I said, "Ooh, Peter, you're going back to Mexico. Give this to someone in two months because it's their day. And there's just something amazing about it. Like, you know, this confirmation of there's no coincidences or you know, that I'm being taken care of and all of it, you know, when I saw this coin and the coin's got like flames on it, it's like got fire. And I attributed to that, like, it's time to, yeah, kindle that, that fire from the spirit within me that, that was lit five years ago. And with each one of these shows, with each, <laughs> with each obstacle I look at or brother I go towards, that fire gets greater and greater. And you know, there's, there's something around it. There's a fear. There's a fear. And this is what I saw in that movie in Aquaman, this fear of magnitude. And so this morning I, I woke up and <clears throat> my, uh, those of you who watch my morning show, I wake up quite early and I went into the sanctuary and I was doing my thing and fighting in spirit and scanning my mind for disturbances. And there was one there that was subtle from the night before. And when I looked at it, it was, it was much deeper than I anticipated and it got me in touch with these beliefs that I've faced before and where my worthiness is and what people want from me and this and I went through it, you know, our levels of mind, the perception with what I'm perceiving in another and what I actually feel, what am I fearing and I shared my fears and when I shared the fear and I got to the belief and I shared the belief that you know, I actually have it written here and <laughs> now I perceive I am afraid of and it was that I'm not, you know, the belief was that I'm not doing enough. And it was so deep when I when I wrote it. And as soon as I wrote it, my phone went off. It was 531 in the morning and my phone went off as right as I, I was like, help me to be willing to let go of this belief. And I wrote that I'm not doing enough. and something that tries to get served back up to me over and over. And I got a message from someone who's never messaged me before at 5.31 in the morning. And I asked him if I could read this to you and I'm going to try to get through it. <laughs> so I read the first line and I, I just literally burst into tears because it was, it was an answer to my prayer. Like I'm looking over here at certain things and the story I tell myself. And then it was like a redirect of spirit. It was like, no, hello, 
we've been watching this thing uh god befriended me and it's like this it's a really corny show and i love it <laughs> it's like terrible acting corny show but the deeper you go into the mind the more you appreciate those type of shows and it was like that experience it was like spirit showing up on my phone and it says dear jeff i just wanted to share with you how you helped me help a brother I have a good friend who drinks on and off, and when he does, we stayed out of contact for months. When he is sober, he is ready to be friends again. In his periods of sobriety, he will be preaching about how raw food and exercise is his way out and how proud he is that he works out every day. I will typically get more and more impatient. I try to be polite, hiding my anger, and leave him feeling lonely. But as, I, as I've been reading the Course and so on, I've been able to let go of having to change him. Yesterday I could allow him to do his thing, and though he sounded like he was further away from the truth than ever before, it was okay. There was a great space in the room and a connection between us. When he asked how I was doing, I gave him the honest answer about my passion for God, talking about guidance, humility, not knowing, vulnerability, and how I try to see the world not as a place to seek fulfillment anymore, and how awesome it all felt. And he said, well, I also love God, but I've given up. Every time I try, I try super hard, working out everything I can, and it is so lonely. What do I... <laughs> What do I do to get a real relationship with God? On, a way, on our way to the meeting yesterday, I knew I wanted to show him your morning show and routine. And there it was, the question. I can see he was resisting as I put it on, the please don't fix me resistance. As he saw the video, the silence grew stronger, and I could see how he felt it strongly. We both did. Afterwards, he shared his mind-blownness <laughs> that he had felt lost and without hope for a long time, but now he felt like there was a method, something tangible to do, and it resonated with him. I think this is a major change in his perception from hopelessness to hope, a realization that we can do this together, but that it takes consistent practice a motivation to redirect his discipline into something meaningful. Could be a life-changing moment, maybe the biggest change I've ever witnessed in another. It's very useful material you put out, and I wanted to say a big thank you. <laughs> and I mean, I literally, I bawled when I read this because, you know, here it is, this constant belief that I'm not doing enough or whatever, and the Spirit's like... <laughs> No, here's a witness, like, here's a witness to show you that you're actually, you're following the guidance you're doing, you're taking the steps, and yeah, it was a huge moment for me because when I'm caught in that, I was sharing with someone else briefly that when I can get in touch with that emotion, like, I could cry from the victim place all I want, but when that deep emotion comes up of a worthiness that I'm actually, my greatest fear is that I am worthy, when I can get in touch with that, it is beyond anything, you know, and I need these miracles to happen, you know, over and over. And I was talking with um, Catherine earlier, and she's facing certain things that, you know, she's maybe selling her house and leaving a job. And I had the same exact experience when I left my job. And my father was my, <laughs> my father was my boss, so it was this huge fear in my mind to walk away from all that or seemingly walk away from it to follow a calling. And I walked out of the office <clears throat> the last day that I was really ever going to go in there and told him, listen, I, I'm done. I talked to my business partner. I walked out and the same thing, my phone buzzed and I looked at it and it was a friend who I hadn't spoken to in four years and he was saying, I just did an interview with Forbes magazine and they asked me, do you know anyone that's missed their calling in life? <laughs> and you were the top one on my list. <laughs> I didn't think, I don't think he had me going for God, that's <laughs> what my calling was, but for me in the moment, it was this reflection of, it's okay, you know, to take these steps, and when I watched this movie, you know, there was a moment in Aquaman where 
you know, he lives on the surface and he's half human and half, and he does his thing to help out and, but he doesn't accept his full inheritance. He doesn't accept, you know, that he is the salvation of the world, the son of God, all the, the sayings. And there's a moment where he has to go all the way and he jumps off the boat and he goes down into the water and he faces where he has to get this trident. And this is a total spoiler alert, but Jason talks a bit about it on his show too. So, and when he's there that he has to pass this, this creature, you know, this huge monster that no one could ever pass and to get the, to let the uh, trident be taken. And as he sits there, the monster comes towards him and he says, of all the people that have ever came, you are the most unworthy. <laughs> it's like, you know, but this is that voice, you know, he's facing that voice in his mind. And what was cool about this is in that moment, he turned to, you know, he, he got down and he looked at himself really. And he turned and his Aquaman thing is he could hold up his hand and he can communicate with the sea creatures. And it was really an understanding of himself when he got in touch with, well, I'm this, I'm a half breed. I'm, he like laid himself on that line. Like, this is what I am. And when he said that, <laughs> the creature was like, oh, you understand me. You know, there was, there was an understanding. And it's funny because it, as soon as I watched that scene, it brought me to this, this one line in uh, the book that I read in the 12 Steps. And it says, but he who has found the solution, and again, the solution is a higher power if you're not comfortable with God, but the solution is God. He who has found the solution, who is properly armed with the facts about himself, you know, looking at these deeper patterns in herself, can generally win the entire confidence of another in a few hours until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. And it's like, that's what I see this interaction with Jonas and his friend. It's like, if we can take the moment to literally pause of that moment of non-judgment you know, this is even in the 12 steps. There's pages 90 through 93 or 91, how to approach someone. We're sharing what we understand from ourselves. Like when we get in touch with that, then we can share from that place. And it was, yeah, it was quite, quite an amazing moment in the movie for me to see that, that bit. And I guess the other thing I wanted to share was this path, like, you know, what me and Catherine have been talking about is, you know, these, these steps are letting go of what we think it is we want or we find attractive in the world. And it was in the littleness, littleness versus magnitude ses session, section from the course. And it says, when you strive for anything in this world in the belief that it will bring you peace, you are belittling yourself and blinding yourself to glory you are as free to try as many as you wish, these forms of littleness, but all you will be doing is delaying your homecoming. For you will be content only in magnitude, which is your way home, which is your home. And it's like I had a little taste of that this morning, you know, this, the magnitude, the worthiness, and I guess I just wanted to share that with, yeah, everyone watching and certainly with Catherine and yeah, we can hear from her now. <laughs> I can use a break, but she's been facing some things. And David visit, and I'll let her speak. Cool. Yeah, so I guess I'll just create a bit of a context, really. Um, this whole uh, property with Mallorca, kind of, you know, David was obviously discussing it when he was here because he was from Portugal. Portugal and um, yeah we would the fact that I'm in banking and you know all of that and I just kind of felt like those are skills that could never ever be used because mm. when I signed up for the retreat for the um, not the retreat the devotionals there it said like you know what are what are kind of things that you do? Can you do audio visual? Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, none of those. Eh? I can do Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, that is really drab. Like no one's ever going to need that in community. And he was just saying, 
we would need something like that because managing this place sounds like it's going to be quite a quite a thing not as not as kind of straightforward and obviously with the euro things are a lot more expensive and and anyway so what you were just talking about now with this whole like searching for things in the world to try and bring you happiness i realized that quite a quite a while ago that it's all pretty futile i feel like i've had this <laughs> this incredible life of like adventure that uh, I was going to say there's not a lot that I haven't done. There is a lot that I haven't done, but there's a hell of a lot that I have done. And it's never resulted in any lasting happiness. And I really just kind of figured this out. Even before the course, I was like, my life has gradually over the years just become more and more simplified because I've lost interest in really doing anything, you know, like exercise or why didn't you do a triathlon I'm like oh god I could think of nothing worse <laughs> you know whereas here it's all the rage and so yeah David and I were discussing this whole concept and and for me the biggest fear is more that it's not going to happen you know I kind of feel like I'm living my life in this this groundhog week you know every week is the same it's all routine there is very limited joy, very. I always say I watch everyone on these shows and everyone's so happy and grateful and I'm like, no, nope, not feeling it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, yeah, my life is, is pretty, I want to say meaningless, you know. Mm. And um, like the, the real joy that I have is when I walk my dogs in the park and I just see how ecstatically happy they are and I'm in this beautiful place with these trees and wide open spaces. And that's my joy, which is probably about 45 minutes, four to five times a week. <laughs> and I'm like, damn, man, that's just really, it's just really pretty crappy. So yeah, my, my biggest thing is hoping that this is really going to materialize, you know? And I, and I said to David, my, my biggest fear is that he's going to be like, listen, we've been doing a lot of thinking. And it's not you. <laughs> you know, like, no, you need to stay in South Africa and figure something else out. You know, so that's kind of where the, the anxiety has come around speaking to my mom. We, we touched on that briefly. Um, I kind of wanted to be 100% um, confirmed before I do anything, before I make any plans, you know. And it, kind of, it reminds me of something that, that Ricky said to me where like you need to commit first, <laughs> you know, and then, and then everything comes. So yeah, I, I've realized like with people in community and just having David here as well and, and really having this amazing opportunity to connect with everyone from Living Miracles, that there's nothing that's certain. <laughs> there's no such thing as like certainty, you know, and it's really just this faith and trust that, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and start making plans as if, as if it's all going to happen. And I'm really just going to trust that it's going to be taken care of. I mean, my biggest thing are my, my animals, you know, they really are, they, they just these symbols of love in my life that are like so gentle and so happy and, you know, and for me, there's that sense of responsibility, you know, that I'm, mm. that I'm responsible for them. Mm. Um, which of course is something that has to be undone. Um, yeah, and then like selling my house and it's so interesting because I took a look around and I just thought, what here would I actually like to take with me? And there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. I'm just like, mm. you know, no, that can, no, don't need any of that, you know. There's certain things that are practical, you know, but in terms of sentiment not really mm. you know, so mm. that's beautiful and yeah. it's it's just like even in in 12 steps you know and we've talked about that before when you originally wrote me and it's the same thing with community that i've talked about on my shows before it's like someone has taken the steps and even as you talk it's like i've left the job i have you know with my parents i didn't have a spouse or 
you know, a girlfriend at the time or children. I didn't have those things. I had a job. I had the house. And then when you talk about dogs, Susanna, as you know, my wife, Susanna, she would love to speak with you about that. She went through a lot of healing around these symbols of, you know, and again, it's these symbols of love that, that show up. And again, even when you started talking, it's like, I don't think anyone, even me, okay, people here think I can do everything. When I first filled out my application, like the, for the first devotional, I'm like, oh, I don't, I have nothing to offer these people. <laughs> like, I was convinced, you know what I mean? It was like, I could do this, a little bit of this and this, but I can, you know, try to do this. And literally, I can do pretty much anything with, you know, him who strengthens me. It's like, and with the people around, it's like, there's nothing. So it's, those are all the things that are presented in the mind. Like, and it's not going to be me. They're going to say no. And all these things, it's like, yeah. Yeah. But for me, the most, um, like, fascinating thing is really just looking back, you know, and kind of seeing how everything works together for good. And there are no exceptions except in the ego's judgments, mm. you know. And, and this whole kind of career path, like, I was, I was, I was in sales for my entire life, which – which is actually very useful because you get to learn all elements of the company. You, you interact with every single department within the company because the company is there to serve the customer to make a profit, but it, it is about the customer ultimately, mm. you know. And, um, yeah, I was so over what I was doing, and it was actually just before I came to the devotional stay that I had this discussion with my boss, and I said, listen, I'm really, I'm really over this. And... Um, she said, okay, well, we'll try and find you something within the company. And I was like, okay, fine. I didn't really hold out much hope. And that, that was in the January. And I then I applied for different positions. And in, in um, the, the industry that I'm in, there were always certain roles. that I thought, oh, that's perfect for me. And I thought, okay, that could always be a fallback. <laughs> Of course, when I was looking, there was like one position available paying really badly, like in some remote place. I was like, damn, okay. And I just said, okay, fine, fine. I have no idea where I'm supposed to be, what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm really just going to let go. And it was agreed that I would stay until the 31st of May because obviously I can't just stay at the company indefinitely, you know, not wanting to, to really be in the position that I'm in. And, yeah, like two weeks before, I mean, I thought I'm going to resign. I was, I was actually quite excited <laughs> to get out of corporate. And, and this position came up within the pricing department. And, like, the whole of Exco was like, we really want you to do this. <laughs> I was like, really? Okay, well, this is, this is what's given, you know. And there's been so much learning and um, – like forgiveness work for me in terms of managing people and like running the department and getting things organized and, and set up, you know, and all of this, it just feels like it's been this um, preparation, you know, mm. this really gentle preparation. Um, yeah. And I just, I look and I see how the learning that I've done, you know, in supply chain and finance has just, yeah, it's like, <laughs> there may actually be a use, you know. And That's what David fine. said, when, when everything is given over to spirit, then he can use that. Because mm. right now what I'm doing is just, it's, it's just one enormous distraction. Yeah. It's just a distraction. All these, all these things that can be used, and it's funny because I'm sitting here in front of a sound booth that I was my company before that I was in for years. I was in real estate management, development, all these things. Now, those things are being even used. We're developing, we're building a studio that I'm over with the help of Nicholas and so forth. And it's like, all these things will be used. I have literally something that was built in my shop back east. I had it shipped out here so that we can do audio recordings from our studio here. And it's like, so there is, there's so many of these things that are, that are used. And it's like, that's it. It's the willingness to hand it over, to hand it over to spirit. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, so it is exciting with Mallorca coming in and, yeah. Very. Yeah, when, when he spoke about it, I just, when, when was it actually? Um, I think it was just before we came to South Africa at that, the, the October retreat 
where there was kind of talk about it and and I just thought oh, I had this like spark, you know. I thought, oh my God, yes. And and it's it's fascinating because like Europe has never been like a, a spark for me as such, you know. But when I when I heard about it, I thought I could definitely I can definitely see myself there, you know. I just felt it. Yeah. And yeah, I when I when I see Lisa's pictures that she posts and the videos, <laughs> I'm just like, Are you kidding? Because the the other big thing that I've realized is that regardless, I don't enjoy living in a city. Yeah. Like I really, really don't. Some people love it and I'm just like, I really don't see any value here whatsoever. I love being in the wide open spaces, which is why I love walking my dogs, you know. It's just it's such a release for me. You'll be uh, you'll be out in the middle of the ocean. It'll yeah. be in Mallorca. And it's funny, I, I had this line come to me this morning, which is, is from a, a famous writer, but I was just thinking as you were speaking that, um, that Mallorca will be your Atlantis if you haven't seen <laughs> Aquaman yet. But I heard this line this morning because when I was reading these lines from, from the course and, you know, about this littleness versus magnitude, and we'll try all these forms of littleness, a different position at work. Oh, it'll be better if I just do this, and that will satisfy me for a while, or, you know, whatever it is. It's like it's this continual thing until we actually do take that leap, until we step back. And it's this one, uh, this one line from C.S. Lewis, and I, and I heard it in my mind, and I looked it up, and then there's actually a line about the ocean in here. So he said, <laughs> It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So it was like I thought of that today, like we can... So maybe that's my prayer as well to even let go. I've been, yeah, going deeper into these things of letting go of possibly the East Coast. My residency is probably going to become Utah. I never thought I'd be an inlander because I was I was like Aquaman. I like like to be by the ocean and everything. But now we have Mallorca coming in. It's like all these things are literally provided for us and. Yeah, we're running out of time here, but I just wanted to, uh, yeah, say thank you. It's great to have, and I told you the other day, it was like I, when LM Virtual, which Spirit TV used to be called, started, I was on the other side of the screen. I started watching and then came on. I remember my first day here. I walked in and sat down and Sarah and someone else was doing a show. They're like, ah, come on on. And they like put me right on the show first thing. <laughs> Never did I realize it'd be on here much more often, but... Like I've shared this morning, it's a gift, you know, once even stepping through any of the fears around it and seeing I can use this for extension and it's never what I think is like, uh, is really an answer to my prayer today. So I want to let go of any of those other things in my mind that try to easily please me and yeah, be open. We have Jason's show coming on, uh, on next and yeah, I know that we'll be seeing a lot more of you, Catherine. So yeah. yeah. You can head to your Atlantis. So thank you so much. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All Thanks, right, Jeffrey. Right. Yes, yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. And to all the rest of you, I'll see you uh, midweek, Tuesday and Thursday, and back on next Sunday. I believe we have one more before the next online retreat. Yeah. So, which is Undo the Doer, which don't you don't want to miss that online retreat. That's going to be a great one. So. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Bye, Catherine.